So just because someone does a complete different practice area, that doesn't mean that they can't teach you how to write in their style um, or how to make submissions. You can see them cross-examining witnesses. Um, you, can, you can learn all of those other skills. You can see how they interact with clients, both lay and professional. So there's always something to learn from everyone. Hello everyone and welcome to the Student Lawyer podcast series. Whether you're at school, sixth form, university, thinking about a career in law or exploring law careers, you're in the right place. We are the one-stop shop for student lawyers. If you'd like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. This episode is sponsored by the University of Law. The University of Law offers a range of undergraduate and postgraduate courses and master's degrees alongside an award-winning pro bono clinic so you can build up your legal experience while studying. And their experienced career service will enable you to put your best foot forward when launching your legal career. The courses are employment focused and based on real legal practice so you'll be better prepared for the workplace. Part-time and online study options are available so you can work and study at the same time. Click the link in the description box of the podcast to find out more about the courses on offer. Hello everyone, welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast. My name is Stephanie, I'm an LLB Law student, I'm a future trainee solicitor and I'm the host of today's episode. With me today on this lovely sunny 4th of July morning is Josh Lewison. Josh is a barrister at Radcliffe Chambers, specialising in trusts, estates and insolvency, both onshore and offshore. Josh is recognised as a leading junior by the legal directories and is also admitted to the State Bar of California. During the episode, Josh and I talk about succeeding in pupillage, getting started at the bar, some of Josh's most memorable cases and the offshore elements to his practice. We also talk about why Josh decided to take the California bar over any other state and how he found the bar exam experience. So welcome to the Student Lawyer, Josh. It's great to have you on the show. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, We're going to talk a little bit later on about the the bar the California bar but before we do get on to you know the main part of the show um, I just wondered if you'd please introduce yourself and your practice yeah absolutely um so I was called to the bar in 2005 and I did my pupillage in 2006 well 2005 2006 um so I started in practice in October of that year um, I, I did law at university, so I came straight through from university into pupillage, and I've been at Radcliffe Chambers uh, ever since. Um, my day-to-day practice is mostly private clients, which means that I um, do litigation about trusts and estates, and I also do uh, litigation in insolvency. So that's bankruptcy of individuals and companies that have gone bust. Excellent. So it sounds like you have quite a varied practice, um, which sounds very exciting. Um, so we, as I said, we're going to talk uh, quite a lot in the show about, you know, your work and um, the California bar. But before we move on to those parts of the show, um, you mentioned you secured pupillage and you did that in 2005, 2006. Perhaps you could just offer to the listeners some um, some advice in succeeding in pupillage and perhaps give some top tips for, you know, drafting whilst you're, you're completing pupillage. Um, sure. I think certainly if you're doing pupillage at a set like ours, um, most of what people see of your work will be your written work. Um, so that although there are opportunities to show off your advocacy um, by doing advocacy exercises or perhaps by producing feedback from the compulsory advocacy courses that you have to do during your pupillage, uh, or even feedback from clients during your, your second six, where you might be going to court on your own a bit, really what, what people are going to be seeing is your written work. And 
to my mind, the, the most important tip really for, for when you're writing is to try and avoid sounding loyally just for the sake of it. So all these sort of here and afters and here to fours and all that sort of archaic language, I think can just be very usefully dumped. Um, the most important thing is that you're communicating um, with your audience. Um, and communication for me means being clear about what you're saying um, in the appropriate way for who you're saying it to. So for example, if you are advising um, an ordinary member of the public who perhaps is having a will dispute with their sibling, um, then you need to write it in a way that a member of the public can understand. If you are advising uh, perhaps the um, general counsel of, of a trust company, then you're writing for a much more legally sophisticated audience. And so you can, you can skip over a lot of the explanations of the more basic legal con concepts. Um, I, it's, it's, always, it's always remarkable to me when, when a solicitor comes back to me and says, oh, thanks so much for that opinion. Um, it was really good, actually. We were able to, to put it straight in front of the client. And I just think, well, don't all your best to do that. Isn't that the whole point, that we are advising the client um, rather than, than the solicitor? Um, so I think that's that's probably my my big tip for um, for pupillage is, is to be be really um, engaged in what you're actually writing and how you're writing it. And there are lots of resources out there that that you can use. Um, some of them are free, um, some of them you have to pay for. But I think um, it, it is worth investing in actual drafting skills and writing skills. That's really interesting. Um, it, it just as you were saying um, throughout, you know, your answer, uh, knowing who your audience is. And I mean, it just reminded me of when I was preparing for my uh, training contract interview, where I was becoming very commercially aware in different sectors and industries. Um, and I think that being commercially aware and having these soft skills as well to be able to know how to speak to people kind of perhaps comes hand in hand when you are speaking to a client. Yes, you do need to know how um, their industry works and, you know, what is going on. But then you also need to adapt your speaking style and your listening you know, skills to fit with, I suppose, that business or industry. So, you know, what you just said there kind of, reminded me of that so thank you for that advice I think that's very helpful um so how in your opinion do you make the most out of pupillage and really maximize on the learning experience I think really you have to treat everything as as a learning experience um even or, po or perhaps perhaps especially um the things that perhaps you're not not so interested in yourself so if, for example, you want to specialize in a particular area of law and one of your pupil supervisors does a completely different area of law, this may actually be your last chance to experience their practice. Um, and, and so really, I think it is worth trying to glean as much as you can from them, because 10 years down the line, when, when that area of law suddenly pops up randomly in one of your cases, you, you won't be completely unprepared. Um, but I think you can you can learn from your pupil supervisors even even things that that um, are, are different from from their areas of law. So just because someone does a complete different practice area, that doesn't mean that they can't teach you how to write in their style um, or how to make submissions. You can see them cross examining witnesses. Um, you can you can learn all of those other skills. You can see how they interact with clients, both lay and professional. So there's always something to learn from everyone. And, and if nothing else, then it will leave you as a, as a more rounded individual. Um, I remember attending a um, skills session about networking. And one of the scenarios was you've been seated at dinner next to someone who's the biggest collector of model railways in the world. You know, what do you do about that? You, you don't care about model railways. You don't know about them. And the answer is, well, you're going to learn a lot about model railways and just enjoy the evening. It doesn't matter that you don't necessarily have anything in common. Um, just just get on with it. I think that's fantastic advice. I think there's you, you know, education and learning is a, such valuable things um, that I think 
you know, never waste an opportunity to speak to somebody, learn something new. Um, you might surprise yourself just because you don't think that you're interested in something or don't, you know, not too bothered. And, um, you know, you may be surprised. I was speaking to somebody not so long ago on an episode of um, the podcast about giving your all, even when you're not particularly interested in something. And, you know, there are benefits from it, you know, the ones we've just discussed. And of course, you know, if you're not giving your all, people perhaps will talk and you don't want to damage your reputation just because at that time you're not really interested in something and you're not giving your, you know, 110%. Um, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think one of the one of the things that um, being being disengaged can lead to is actually people thinking you're not very bright. So that if, if, for example, you want to do trusts and you're sitting with a commercial pupil supervisor and you just cannot be bothered, um, then actually that person may think, oh, well, I'm not sure that, that, that this pupil is very good at law because they, they haven't really got to grips with this skeleton argument that I'm writing. They haven't looked into the law in any great detail. Um, so maybe they're just not up to this job. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think as well, it show, shows in your work as well. So, you know, you never know if the client a bit later on will, you know, hear your name and perhaps not be, I don't know, mm-hmm. no client to work with you. Um, but anyway, thank you for that advice. So what do you think are the most valuable soft skills to have um, and how can they be learned? Um. I think this this really comes down to personal preference and, and how we are. For me, my my personality is such that um, I am much more drawn to people I feel are authentic um, and people who aren't putting on an act um, and people who aren't trying to, uh, I suppose, sell themselves to me, whether whether sort of almost literally like touting for business or or trying to impress me in some way. I much prefer just to have a have a good conversation with someone. Um, and when I see other lawyers who, who are doing the hardcore networking um, with their pre-practice elevator pitches and, and boasting about all these great cases they're in at the moment, I always find that sh- that's a bit cringe. And I, I just prefer to, to be more natural. So in a sense, it's, it's almost unlearning um, some of the skills that perhaps are taught to people, um, whether at, at the sort of vocational level or, or by attending actual networking seminars. I mean, we'll, we all go to them. Um, but I think coming across as this very polished networking machine is certainly a, a turn off to me. And I think perhaps it is a bit of a turn off to other people. Um, so I think, I think perhaps the most important thing is, is just being confident in, in who you are at the particular place you are in your career. When your three years call, I don't think anyone really expects you to be a silk. Um, and so you don't have to swan around as though you know everything and you've you've had all the experiences and um, you, know, you go to the to the Supreme Court and you shout at the justices every other Monday. Um, it's in, it's enough to be who you are and, and have seen and done what you've seen and done. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I see what you mean about the whole you know networking. I think that those um, like disingenuous people who do use those events to kind of just um not be you know their genuine selves have given the name networking a bit of a a bad name um it was always a little bit cringe to have enjoyed networking um but you know i love going to uh these events because it could just goes back to what we were saying um i love meeting new people and you know learning about their industries and what they have going on and you know it's that being genuinely um interested about what people are doing um so yeah perhaps these networking events should get a revamp and a rename um but yeah thank you for sharing your advice i think that was very helpful so moving into the second part of the interview, um, after you've really succeeded at your pupillage, after everybody has followed Josh's advice, um, how can a barrister really shape their practice? Um, well, I think it's probably 50% luck and 50% hard work. Um, certainly when I got started, I was expected to practice in every area of law 
that Chambers offered. Um, and, and that was quite hard, actually, because you have to keep abreast of uh, developments in, in eight or nine different areas of law. And that becomes harder and harder as time goes by. Um, and really, if you, if you do want to shape your practice in a particular direction, that means that on top of keeping your workload going, you have to be promoting yourself and building your knowledge and experience in the areas that you do want to practice in. And so that might mean writing articles, giving talks, going to conferences, a, lo a lot of stuff that goes beyond just doing the work and doing it well. Um, and then, and then you need you need some luck, um, and perhaps you get get a big break, or perhaps you you meet someone who you really click with, um, and who instructs you in a really good case. Um, there, there's a story actually that's that's told um, about uh, Lord Newberger that um, a barrister came back to Chambers one day after a hard day at, at court, and the clerk said, "Oh, we've got another brief for you tomorrow morning, sir." Um, in Bow County Court, trespassers' possession, and this barrister said, "Oh, do I really have to do it?" And the clerk said, "No, nope, that's all right. We'll get Mr. Newberger to do it." And so Mr. Newberger, as he then was, went off to court, and the judge did something absolutely bonkers, and the case got appealed all the way to the House of Lords with a young David Newberger in tow, and that was that was the start of his meteoric rise into a very quick silk, and then on the bench, and then all the way up to the to the House of Lords, and then back down, and then back up. Excellent. See, like never, never, never let an opportunity go by. I think it's um, it's a it's a difficult one to kind of like know when you really need some rest when you've worked you know crazy amount of hours in a week, and to know when you need to give yourself a little bit of downtime. Mm. But also, well, not that's where the luck comes in, though, because this to to anyone else, this could have been just an ordinary trespassers possession claim. And there was no telling that this would go all the way because it, it took the perfect combination of a mad judge um, and a mad client with deep pockets, and and there was no no telling in advance that that those that those you know, that perfect storm um, was there in that case. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is going to stay with me now, and you know, forever more. Um, so when my when the dark circles underneath my eyes are getting bigger and bigger, because I just cannot turn down any work, I will thank you for that, Josh. Um, so how can um, how can barristers really build on their experience? Well, again, I think it it comes down to treating treating your cases as a learning experience and something that I found very helpful certainly in, in, the, in the early years um, was when I was against more senior opponents so people much more experienced than me um, who specialized much more heavily in those areas of law that I was entering um, and learning from them um, it was almost almost like getting a second day or two of, of pupillage, seeing an opponent who was actually really good at what they did. Um, perhaps they, they cross-examined a witness in a really good way. Perhaps they um, made their submissions in a particularly compelling style. Um, and that's not to say that you have to emulate them. It's, it's more exposure. Um, so you're getting more out of it than what you yourself have done. You're getting a bonus um, by, by seeing them. And I mean, another way you can build your experience uh, is, is to do pro bono work. Um, so there, there's no shortage of people with no money with, who have terrible legal problems. Um, and so if, if you do feel that uh, perhaps you want to do more work in a particular area of law, one thing that you can do is volunteer to do these cases. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you can always start your career kind of like learn from people learn from osmosis just you know being very present and seeing what is going on around you being very self-aware and um, you know just and things keep leading back to never stop learning so I think that's um, a great point so when when a barrister becomes very specialized in their area of law and do take up uh, pro bono work do they stay with the um, kind of like their specialist area or can they help, you know, anybody that is in need of um, a legal um, advice? Well, you can help anyone who's who's in need. Uh, I think perhaps you have to ask yourself whether you're really helping. By the time that they, they make it to the 
bar pro bono units, which are now called advocates, you probably can't make things any worse, but there may be some missed opportunities to make things better if you don't really know what you're doing. Um, but often the, the problem often is that they just don't know what they're doing at all. So they'll have made any number of procedural mistakes. They'll have missed points of law that you can pick up. So you are making things better. Um, I give you an example. One of the um, pro bono cases I did that, that really sticks in my mind was actually my first proper outing to the Court of Appeal, where um, my client had been running a petrol station in Wales uh, and felt that he had been um, done over by, by the fuel company that was supplying the petrol that he sold. He had been sued by them um, in the commercial court in Birmingham, I think, um, and they'd actually got summary judgments against him, um, largely because he hadn't really got to grips with his case. Somehow he had managed to get himself permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal. Now, unfortunately, we, we lost the appeal, but by the end of it, um, by getting involved and by setting out his case in some detail and having the other side respond to us in some detail, he actually felt much better than he had done before to the extent that in fact he he um, shook hands with the solicitor on the other side um, in a sort of way to signal that this dispute was now over and he did accept the outcome. Um, so even though we were no, no further ahead um, in terms of his case, um, I think for him that was actually quite an important experience to have that he had someone with him to go through um, this, you know, this very difficult legal process. Yeah, he felt like justice had been served, even if it didn't, you know, favour him. He mm. went through it and he did the all he could do. Um, you know, that makes sense. So we're going to talk about pro bono work a little bit later on. Um, but if you could perhaps uh, give your advice on how to really make contacts and connections when you're um, when you're getting started at the bar. Well, this really comes down to to being there. Um, you can't you can't sit in chambers and wait for the phone to ring. Um, you can you can write your articles and put them on the website, or you can put them on LinkedIn. Um, you can you can do that sort of thing. But again, that really that really depends on people actually reading them and remembering who you are, rather than remembering the contents of the article. I think it's easy to remember. Oh, I've read an interesting article about this, and here are some interesting ideas, and then forget who's written it. Um, so, so for me, it's all about meeting people. And so you need to look out for conferences that you can go to events that you can go to. And again, some of them are quite expensive, but actually a lot of them are free. There are an increasing number of, um, of sort of junior associations that you can join. So in, in the trusts, trust and estate space, there's something called Contra, which is aimed at more junior solicitors and more junior barristers, um, with the express idea that, um, at the top end of, of this, you could be paying hundreds, if not thousands of pounds to attend a conference, but actually Contra can put on free events during the year. And then there's quite a low cost annual conference that is, is very popular. Um, and so by being at these events and actually meeting people, talking to people, listening to people, um, you actually can establish yourself and, and you know who, who's in the know, who is well connected, um, who's on top of their practice and who's just faking it. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that. So after you've made it at the bar <laughs> and you're and you're um, doing cases, doing really significant cases, memorable cases, um, as you are now, some have got to really stick out in your mind. Um, and I know that we have talked and, you know, before this episode and you've, you've offered me some. So I know that ball and ball really um, is memorable to you. So perhaps you could just explain some of the facts of that case and the procedural history, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a dispute between three members of a family or siblings. Um, two of the siblings were involved in a family business and one of them went out on his own and did his own thing. And, and the divide between them has been a cause of friction. Um, and the particular forum in which this, this friction uh, made itself felt in this case was a trust 
that was set up under their father's will back in 1978. Um, and within the trust, there were some shares in the family business and there were some other investments. And um, the brother, Jonathan, who'd gone out on his own, um, was asking for an account. And in, in the trust world, trustees always have to account for their dealings with the trust. And what Jonathan was seeking was reams and reams of information going all the way back to 1978. Uh, so it was, it was a very onerous burden. And actually, we thought that his true intention was to try and pull apart the family business um, and um, show that he was somehow entitled to share in it, despite never having worked for it. What made it actually really memorable was that this is an area of law that has not been particularly um, well documented or well explained in the books. So when, when the books talk about trustees' duty to account, they just really say, oh, the trustees have a duty to account. They didn't really say what that involves. Um, so we felt that we had produced quite a lot of information, um, probably more than Jonathan was entitled to, but he felt that he was entitled to more and more and more. And eventually he sued us. Um, and so, so what was in dispute was whether we had in fact provided an account. And you'd think this would be quite an easy question to answer. We did think it was quite an easy question. We thought the answer was obviously yes, um, but this still, still required a day and a half of court time. Um, and it requires actually thinking in some detail about what it means for a trustee to account. Um, and what made it particularly memorable for me was that I had gone back over some of the cases and tried to distill the principles down into five or so points, saying a trustee giving their account must do these three things or these five things. That then got picked up in the judgment so that uh, the judge who heard it said in his judgment, I accept Mr. Lewison's um, submission that trustees who give an account must do these five things. Um, and then even better than that, one of the legal textbooks picked out that judgment. And so now in Snell's equity, it says when a trustee gives an account, they must do these five things. So from, from my skeleton argument to Snell's equity, um, I've managed to, I feel I've managed to sort of contribute something to the development of the law, which certainly doesn't happen every day. Well, congratulations. And what a fantastic outcome, you know, for your client and for yourself as well. Um, I, I think that's excellent. So uh, perhaps we could talk about another uh, very memorable case of yours now, um, which touches on pro bono again. So Paratus, if I pronounce that correctly, AMC and Lewis. We've kind of, well, for our listeners who aren't too sure about what pro bono is, if you could just um, explain that for us a little bit in detail um, and then go on to, you know, what the facts of the case um, are in this case and also the procedural history. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so pro bono work is work that you do for free. Um, and people do pro bono work for different reasons. Um, some people feel that it is inherent in what lawyers do that we should do pro bono work because um, the law is difficult and the system is hard to navigate and people require assistance and sometimes they literally just cannot afford it. And so we should help them, whether to help them or whether to help the justice system so it doesn't get clogged up with people sort of flailing around and um, taking up court time when they, when they don't need to. Um, some people see it as um, giving back in a way so that the, the, the rewards of being a lawyer um, can be very high for some people. And um, so it's almost a, a sort of charitable thing to, to give away one's time for free um, to do pro bono work. Um, other people do it to get the experiences we've already touched on. Um, and sometimes it can just be um, quite fun to do and, and, so Paratus AMC and Lewis falls into this category. This was some, there's, there's a pro bono program called CLIPS, which is the Chancery Litigants in Person Scheme. The Chancery Division um, runs a, a daily court for urgent applications. And what often happens is that litigants in person turn up. Um, so parties to litigation who are unrepresented and they make an application to the High Court judge. And maybe they should be there, maybe they shouldn't be there, but they, they often make a very poor job of it simply because they don't know what they're doing. And 
other barristers are there waiting to have their applications heard and listening to this and thinking I could do such such a, a much better job of this, um, even with very little preparation. And so that led the Chancery Bar Association to set up CLIPS um, so that litigants in person can turn up just before the application court starts and get free representation from a barrister um, who's had minimal prep time, but who does have the knowledge and experience, um, hopefully to make things better. Certainly they won't make them any worse. Um, and, and you can have a barrister who will go in and argue your case for you. Um, Mr. Lewis was, was one of these. Uh, what had happened to him was that his house had been repossessed by the mortgage company. They had sold it and they had um, a surplus. So they paid themselves off and then they had more money that, that they had to pay back to him. But there was a dispute with him over how much money they should be paying to him. And there were other creditors uh, who wanted some of that money as well. And so they applied to pay into court. They applied to pay in a particular sum. And what they actually paid in was rather less than that. And so Mr. Lewis went to court and got an order um, that they should pay in the rest. They then applied to pay in um, less than they'd actually paid in, but they didn't comply with the original order that they should pay in um, 180 odd thousand. They didn't comply with the order um, that Mr. Lewis got, that they should pay in the balance. And so by the time Mr. Lewis engaged me, um, they were in Paratus were in default of two court orders, ordering them to pay money into court. So they, they did have a pretty strong case that they should get the relief that they sought. And so he argued it out. And I had some pretty good arguments, but, but ultimately the judge decided that, um, that yes, they should have a sort of corrective order so they could pay in less than they had originally sought. Um, but the really good bit was that the judge was extremely unimpressed with the way that Paratus had behaved um, on this. They had um, disobeyed two court orders. They hadn't apologized to the court in any way. Um, and in the course of his judgment, the judge said, um, said something like, the court deprecates uh, Paratus' blasé attitude to orders of the courts. And I, and I thought, you know what? Th this judge is, is like a sort of angry Santa. Whatever presents he can give out to us, we're gonna get. Um, and so I took some instructions from Mr. Lewis, um, sort of with a view to, to making Paratus' life as difficult as possible. And um, what I ended up asking the judge for was, first of all, a pro bono costs order, which was quite a new thing back then. And the second thing I asked for uh, was that a transcript of the judgment should be prepared um, and published on Bailey. And the judge was very keen on both of these ideas. Um, and my opponent um, tried to try to persuade him that it was not appropriate uh, to to make an order in particular about the transcript. So he said, "Oh well, you know, um, I'm going to report back to to my solicitors and my clients, and, and they will they will know what what your lordship's um, view is of their behaviour." And and he, and he went on to say, "What Mr. Lewis is trying to do um, is is publicise this breach," and the judge said. Quite yes, he is. <laughs> As though this was this was absolutely um, you know, the most natural thing that they should that Mr. Lewis should try and do, and so we came away with um, with a cost order for a very modest sum, um, but more importantly, we had this transcript which went up on Bailey, um, and uh, there's a really terrific blog about housing called Nearly Legal, um, which is run by a solicitor called Giles Peaker, and he blogged about it. Um, so it caused a bit of a stir, and it got some good publicity for clips. It was just a really terrific case. It was just such fun to be out there um, making these arguments for someone who who might have been able to make them for himself, but um, perhaps wouldn't have thought about um, getting the ancillary relief of, of the transcripts and the cost order. So that was that was just a really terrific day out. Excellent. Well, it does sound like you have been involved in some um, fun and unusual cases. And for anybody who is interested in checking out that um, transcript, I will perhaps do my part in sharing um, or spreading the news and put a link to the <laughs> transcript in the show notes. Um, so I will do my job of passing that along. That one's actually made its way to two textbooks as well, now I think of it. Um, 
Uh, so one of them is G on injunctions, which is quite a quite a leading textbook. And it says it's it's cited for the proposition: if the court orders you to do something, you should do it. Josh, we're gonna have to get your signature and uh, <laughs> and you know put it in with a student lawyer handbook. I think that's quite appropriate thing to do. I'd like to take a moment to speak about the University of Law, which is the university I decided to study my LPC at. The University of Law is the sponsor of this podcast and makes it possible for us to continue bringing these episodes to you. So we really appreciate you supporting us by supporting our sponsors. What really sets the University of Law apart from other universities is its belief in training students for the real world from the moment they accept a place. The University of Law's experienced career service and award-winning pro bono clinics offer students the chance to get real-life legal experience which can boost employability. They offer a range of undergraduate and postgraduate legal training and master's degrees designed by qualified experts to help students excel at any stage of their career. Their courses are employment focused, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. Part-time and online study options are also available on many of their courses courses to help students work and study at the same time. If you'd like to find out more about the courses on offer, please click the link in the description box of the podcast. Um, Okay, so moving on now to the offshore elements of your practice. Um, You know, at the beginning of the show, I mentioned that you do onshore and offshore work. Um, So perhaps if you could start off by explaining, you know, what offshore is and perhaps where it is. And when a lawyer specialises in offshore work, yeah, what, I mean, what are you referring to? Um, off- offshore means a lot of different things to different people. Um, to me, offshore means doing work um, that is connected with jurisdictions uh, that are typically quite small jurisdictions, but with comparatively large um, legal and, and financial centres. Um, so we are talking about places like Jersey, Guernsey, the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands. Um, and essentially the way that, that these places developed was that in, in the years when the British Empire was collapsing, um, there was less funding available from London. Um, regulation in London was increasing. And so these jurisdictions spotted opportunities to foster financial services industry. So they started with the banks and where the banks went, the trust companies followed. Um, And with the banks and the trust companies, the lawyers followed, financial advisors followed. And so they they have, over the last 30 or 40 years, grown up really serious centres of legal and financial expertise. Um, And they have absorbed some of the most um, interesting work that there is out there. So I think when when lawyers say that they specialise in offshore work, they do offshore work as part of their practice. Um, what they're really saying is that they um, advise in some of the some of the most interesting cases, and they work with some of the most elite lawyers in their particular fields. Nice. So, uh, what does your offshore practice consist of, and how does it compare to your onshore practice? Well, my offshore practice is is a mix, as as my onshore practice of private clients and insolvency. Um, the cases will tend to be more international, um, both in terms of where where structures and assets are, and where the people themselves are, and and the numbers may be may be bigger as well. Um, so, to give you a couple of examples, um, I had a case in the Bahamas a few years ago where um, the assets in dispute were on the order of $2 billion. And the story was that um, an Italian Nigerian businessman who'd made his money in the oil industry in Nigeria um, had put his um, business into a trust for the benefit of himself, his wife, and his children. Um, he divorced his wife, he fell out with his children, and he um, uh, and the trustees decided to uh, transfer the business back to him. And uh, at least one of his children was very unhappy about that. And that's where the litigation started. So, so already we see you know, the big numbers, um, a very sort of multi, multinational family. And 
the arguments were quite complex because the trust has um well, the, the trust company had started life in Panama it had moved to the Bahamas it then moved on to New Zealand and so there were all sorts of difficult legal questions um about uh, what the governing law of the trust was which courts had jurisdiction um there was also an arbitration clause so did we have to go to arbitration we make the other side go to arbitration and and it's exactly the sort of really exciting and interesting case that um that really makes the job so so enjoyable you're really getting stuck into something so that's that's a good example of an offshore case which is uh, which has a much wider scope i suppose than than what you might see onshore these days sounds very complex um but yeah it does sound like it is very interesting and something that will um really test you or push you i suppose you must get great satisfaction from working on um very complex cases like that absolutely and and again you know that case um, I was being led by two QCs, one, one Bahamas QC and one English QC, um, both leaders in their field. And so it was an enormous learning experience. That's great. Um, so the Panama paper scandal that mm. has been quite a hot topic in recent years has sparked you know, quite a lot of debates about uh, the surrounding offshore tax havens and uh, tax avoidance schemes. So all well and good. However, offshore work isn't all money laundering and tax evasion. So what are some of the practical purposes that offshore trusts, funds and companies have? Um, And how are barristers involved in that? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, I think it we we do have to acknowledge that certainly historically and and to an extent still today, um, there is money laundering and there is tax avoidance um, in the offshore world. That is perhaps an artifact of the way that they grew up. Um, But nowadays, I think um, the offshore jurisdictions, at least the mainstream offshore jurisdictions, would say rightly that they are much more tightly regulated um, than some onshore jurisdictions. So, for example, if I wanted to open a bank account in the Cayman Islands, um, I would be subjected to quite a detailed background check. Um, But when I recently opened a current account at Barclays in the UK, there was almost nothing. So money laundering is a problem everywhere. Um, Tax avoidance is a problem everywhere. And the offshore jurisdictions are quite an easy target um, because they're not here. Um, And it's much easier to to make hostile noises about the offshore world than it is to try and clean up, um, say, what goes on um, in the back streets of the City of London. And And there are many practical purposes that offshore trusts and funds and companies have. Um, In terms of trusts, uh, if you set up your trust offshore, then you immediately have access to a network of professionals um, who can provide a really Rolls-Royce service in everything from um, investment advice through to actually managing the trust fund, keeping it safe and keeping it private. So if, for example, you are Um, someone who is fairly wealthy and you come from an unstable country uh, or a country where you may be at risk of um, political reprisals for for your political views or activities uh, or where um, you may be at risk of kidnap, um, then you may wish to structure your your wealth in such a way that it's protected. Similarly, you may wish to uh, ensure that you can leave your property to people you want to have it on your death. And some, some countries have um, very strict rules about who you can leave your property to. And you may not wish um, to leave your property in accordance with those rules. So again, an offshore trust will, will help you to do that. Funds is something you, you, you've mentioned. Um, when, in, in most jurisdictions, when you buy and sell shares or other investments um, and you make a profit on those, you'll have to pay capital gains tax. And so that can, can slow down um, the the process of actually raising investments, um, and by using an offshore fund in a jurisdiction that doesn't charge tax on those kinds of transactions, um, you can achieve a much more frictionless um, means of generating investments. Um, people people will point to that and say, well, that's surely that's tax avoidance, that's tax evasion, even. Um, but actually, that it misses the point that there are real world participators in these funds, and they pay tax in their home jurisdictions. So the idea is to avoid being taxed twice on the same transaction. Um, And and the offshore world is responsible for for raising huge amounts of capital, actually, in the offshore bond market. 
um, so that people make their investments offshore. And then that money comes in off- onshore. And um, it can be quite surprising um, how many projects um, in London even um, are funded in part from, from offshore investments. Um, barristers, barristers are obviously involved um, mostly in litigation. So when things go wrong, um, barristers are there to help pick up the pieces um, and sort out who's entitled to what. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I feel like I've really got some advice now that I will be able to take with me in my legal profession and perhaps, you know, in my private capacity as well. So thank you very much for sharing those, um, for sharing that advice. Before I move on to the next question, uh, just as we were talking about the Panama Papers, or I used it as a reference, um, Josh, have you ever seen the film, I think it's called The Laundry Mat? I don't think I've seen that one. So it's about the Panama Papers. They've made it really funny. Um, It's on Netflix. I do advise um, law students to, to watch it because it is one of those films that you can get a lot of commercial awareness from. Um, I just say, so perhaps when you're a bit sick and tired of, you know, hitting the books and preparing for um, your uh, interviews, chill out or try to chill out watching a film, you know, knowing that you're still doing somewhat of um, interview prep. Yeah, what, one, one thing that um, I actually do remember from the California Bar course was um, our ethics lecturer um, encouraging us to watch courtroom dramas and legal shows to spot ethics violations, because that's the thing they always get wrong. They might get the law right, but they always get the ethics wrong. Amazing. So it's that creative thinking, just trying to find new ways of of, um, learning different things. So I I tried to watch fun things like that in my spare time. There was also a documentary on Netflix about how uh, different industries have grown throughout time. Um, that, That was a fun one to watch. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, for sharing that advice with us, Josh. So, can all barristers who have passed the England and Wales bar have an offshore practice? Um, yes. Yeah, so it, again, it depends on what you mean by an offshore practice. If if you are giving advice as an English barrister, then you can you can advise anyone um, who who comes to you. If you actually want to appear in court in offshore jurisdictions, then you'll normally need to be called to the local bar. Some are easier than others. Um, so BVI, British Virgin Islands is quite flexible. Channel Islands, so Jersey and Guernsey are much more difficult. You actually have to go there. In Jersey, you need to do a two year equivalent of a training contract. Um, in Guernsey, you need to do that. Plus you need to do three months learning um, Norman law at the University of Caen. Um, so, so that's much more difficult. They're essentially closed to, to outsiders. I see. And do you get do you get to travel a lot? Do you get to go to these places and well you can do? It's less common now because we do so much by Zoom. If before the pandemic, yes, you you would go um quite often, whether to appear in court or to have meetings. But um, but nowadays the the travel time can be cut down quite significantly. Yeah. Um so I mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's a lovely sunny morning on Monday, the 4th of July. So uh, I thought it would be quite fun to talk about your experience at the US bar. You know, what a better day to do it on. So Josh, if you wouldn't mind explaining what the California bar is and can every UK lawyer be admitted? Yeah, okay. Well, there are 50 states in the union and every state has its own bar. Um, plus there's a, a bar for the District of Columbia um, and the US offshore territories like Puerto Rico and the American Virgin Islands. Every bar has its own bar exam and every state has different criteria on which you can be admitted. So some states, and New York is one of these, will recognize a UK law degree. Other states, and California is one of these, Um, will allow you to sit their bar exam if you are a foreign attorney. And that means a foreign attorney who's who's entitled to practice. And that means for us that you've got to have done your pupillage or done your training contract um, before you can sit the bar in California. But in places like New York, um, then you just need a law degree. So can being um, dual qualified UK and US, uh, can that qualification benefit uh, career progression and prospects? difficult to say really uh 
I think for some for some people it might. If you're working as a firm that does um, a lot of transatlantic work, then certainly I've found that it's quite helpful to understand how the American system works. So you, even if I may never appear in court in California, arguing a case there, um, I, I do at least understand the federal court system, the state court system. Um, I know many of the principles of, of um, California law in my areas of practice. So I think in that in that way, it does give you a useful extra perspective. Um, it's where the law is different in particular, it allows you to question whether English law does need to be the way that it is or has always been or will always be the way that it is. Um, because you can see that a different system does things differently and seems to do perfectly well. So I, to give you to give you an example, um, in England, um, you can't have a trust that's set up for purposes that aren't charitable. So, for example, you can have a trust to, um, uh, to, to for the relief of poverty. And that's a purpose, and that's a charitable purpose. So that's okay. Um, but you can't have a trust um, to um, build a new stately home or to maintain a stately home unless that's charitable, and usually it won't be. But actually, in other jurisdictions, you can have non-charitable purpose trusts, and they get on perfectly well. Um, and all you need to do is provide that some person can enforce them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's that's the sort of perspective that you might get um, by by learning the law of any other system, whether whether a US state or or, or um, you know, an offshore jurisdiction. I imagine it makes you or have the ability to think think creatively. I suppose when you're trying to solve a legal problem. Is that, is that right? Is that yes, well, there is that. So you, you can see how other people have solved it as well. So one of the, I, I went to a talk recently about no contest clauses in English wills. So let's say that you think someone might challenge your will. You can say that you can say in your will, I leave this person fifty thousand um, pounds, but if they challenge the validity of this will, they get nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and. The, the English courts have developed a test um, that sort of enforces those um, those types of clause, but um, only where there's probable cause, quote unquote, um, for them to have brought the challenge. But nobody really has, under, has understood in what probable cause means in this context. Well, in California, th- they do. And so that's there in, in, the, in the probate code. And so you can look to another system to say, California has answered the question, what is probable cause in this way? And then you can bring that back um, and and offer that as a perspective. Yeah. In England. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can really see how there's there's a lot of benefits. So you mentioned that there's over 50 states. Over 50? How many is there? 50, 50 states and, 50 and states. probably half a dozen other territories. I missed geography class on that day. <laughs> they, were, they were explaining that. So thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, so why did you decide to take the California California bar in particular over any other state? And how did you find the bar exam experience? Well, I chose California. Well, really, the, cho- the choices were between New York and California. Um, I felt that California um, was perhaps... Uh, more exclusive because a lot of people do the New York bar um, on the basis of their law degree, but very few people seem to do California. I think in my year, any in, in my they do it twice a year, and in my administration of the exam, I think there are only four people from the UK who did it. It it is also said that the California bar is harder than any other bar exam. Um, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. It's it's a three day exam. It used to be a three-day exam rather than a two-day exam, so there's more of it. But I don't think the questions are any more difficult than anywhere else. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was great fun. Um, you know, back to learning old law, so, so things like crime and tort are very similar, but, but some areas of law are completely new. So there was US constitutional law, which is fascinating, and community property, which is um, how you allocate property on divorce, which, again, was really, really interesting um, and then the exam was quite fun as well, because I was I was just studying on my own in London. I was the only person in London doing it on that particular course. Um, and then 
five months after I'd started, I was walking into a convention center in Oakland with 2000 people who'd all been studying for the same exam. And we were all there together, all doing, doing this exam. It was terrific. It does sound like fun. It does. So you mentioned that it's a three-day exam or perhaps two now. It's gone down to two, yeah. Hopefully they've, you know, cut out some of the questions and not made you do it in a shorter amount of time. Um, so it's two days. And how long, how, like, how long is the prep work? How long do you have to actually, you know? Um, well, one of, one of the things that's, that makes um, the bar exam in America really um, democratic is that you can take as, as much or as little time as you want to prepare for it. Okay. So your responsibility is to pay $750, which is the exam fee, um, and show up on the day of the exam and answer the questions. And what you do to get there is really up to you. So I did a course on Friday evenings and Saturday mornings that lasted for five months. And that's, that's how I chose to do it. But you could do it uh, by reading books on your own. And you could do it by buying some flashcards and teaching yourself the law of your flashcards. And you can take five years, you can take five days, and it's up to you how, how well you feel that you've prepared. So Kim Kardashian, for example, is doing it over a course of, I think, three or four years, um, studying with a tutor. And that's fine. You can do it that way. Okay. That's really good to know. Thank you. How did you prepare and what are your top tips for passing the California bar? Um, well, I, I prepared using a commercial course um, from Barbary, which is one of the bigger providers. Um, and I think there are probably three or four big providers who provide video lectures, practice questions, course materials, you know, a whole package, um, which for me, with not many American legal resources around, was, was certainly the best way of doing it. Um, I think my top tip, almost harking back to where we started, um, was that a lot of the uh, a lot of the marks are to be gained through exam technique. So when you're writing an answer to a problem question, there's a particular style um, that examiners feel really helpful. Um, feel feel is really helpful because they've got to mark thousands of papers. They get something like five dollars a paper. Um, and they're trying to mark law essays and they've got to get it done pretty quickly. So they want to get done, get through each paper as quickly as they possibly can. And so there's a technique that involves using lots of headings arranged in quite a standardized way that, that allows the examiner to go through bang, 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 you know, an essay that took you 45 minutes to write, they can mark it in a couple of minutes um, and they can pull out all the, all the points that you've answered and they can grade it. Uh, so that, that's, that's the written bit. Um, California also includes a performance test, um, which I think is probably where law students find it much more difficult. Um, the idea is you're given a, a file of facts and a file of law, and you're asked to do something which might be um, advising a client, so writing a, 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 an opinion, basically, or writing a brief that goes to a jury or a memorandum that goes to a judge. Um, and when you're a barrister, this is what you do. This is this is the job. Um, when you're a student, you're probably not really used to doing that. Um, and that counts overall for 35% of the marks. So there's a lot of marks to be there, which is just on legal technique. So that perhaps put me at a bit of an advantage. But again, the answer to that is practice, practice, practice. Um, do lots of test questions. Um, if you're signed up to a course that gives you feedback, make sure you take the feedback. Um, and and just make sure you're ready to do this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done a little bit of research into um, the New York and California bar, and Barbary is something is an organisation that keeps popping up um, when I do Google, and they it does look like a fantastic organisation. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well for anybody else who's interested in learning more about that. Um, and then you mentioned about as a specific way of answering a problem question in the exam is it the same in the uk is it iraq or is it they got it is it? iraq yeah all right okay so iraq is gold everybody never forget that um that's good to know thank you josh um so how has the qualification complemented your onshore and offshore practice um has it impacted your personal development as well 
I, I think it's 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 complemented my onshore practice um, by, as I said, just giving me extra perspectives, extra research avenues. Something that I've that I've always tried to do when I've had the time is when I've um, written an opinion on the matter of English law, try and work out what the answer would be in California. Um, so just to keep that area of, of my legal knowledge sharp, um, but also just to see if there's some other rule that may have you know, slipped beneath beneath the textbook writer's notice in England, um, but actually the cases are all still there. Offshore, it's much more flexible because you can you can cite more law from different jurisdictions offshore. So um, perhaps it's a bit more a uh, bit more of a string to my bow in that area. Um, and personal development, it's something that people always are interested to hear about. Um, so if nothing else, it's something to mention um, when someone says, you know, what do you do? What sort of experiences have you got? You can say, oh, well, you know, I've been called in California. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's something that people people are interested to hear about. I I really like the, that you, you know, write the opinion in what it would be in California as well. Um, you know, it's like learning a different language. If you don't use it, mm. you may forget it. So I think that that's really impressive and, and um, something to keep in mind, um, you know, when, when you do have to um, or when you have done something that takes a like a great deal of work to to keep practicing it. I mean, I imagine that's quite um, timely and create and takes a lot of, you know, mental energy as well. So to keep that up, I, I think that, you know, just shows like shows great stamina and um, it, it's very impressive. I must say. Um, so is there a specific US case or a significant legal matter that really captures your attention? Well, at the moment, we're spoiled for choice, really, aren't we? Um, because we've just had the decision in Dobbs about abortion rights in America. Um, and that's come hard on the heels of Bruin, which is about carrying guns in public. And there's another one on the cards um, called Moore, I think, which is going to be about the conduct of elections. So one of, one of the most interesting areas of US law is US constitutional law. I think having studied it really does give me much deeper insight into some of the issues that are being aired um, at the moment in the Supreme Court and how much it does matter um, that the Supreme Court is quite so powerful in America um, as compared to, to the, our Supreme Court here in, in the UK. And well, I don't think we've really got time to, to delve into the, into the specifics of these cases, um, but I think the ability of a court um, to shape everyday life in, in such a, a meaningful and impactful way um, is just really interesting to see and, and can be quite troubling actually to see at times. Mm, definitely. So we're coming to the end of the interview now. So there's really only one thing left for me to do, and that is to wish you a happy 4th of July and to ask you how you're spending the day. Uh, well, we already celebrated over the weekend because we don't get the public holiday here, but maybe we'll crack open a, a Bud Light later. Fantastic. I mean, I... Um, I'm certainly going to take my laptop outside and work in the sunshine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I might um, get a cocktail or a glass of wine perhaps later on in the afternoon and celebrate the 4th of July. That's a California rosé. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or just perhaps celebrate, you know, this, um, this interview here with you today. So thank you very much for joining us on this episode of uh, The Student Lawyer, Josh. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Well, thanks for inviting me. Well, I hope you come back one day soon um, and we can chat about the other memorable cases that you will have between now and then. So thank you everybody for tuning in to another episode of the Student Lawyer Podcast. Um, it's been great to have you here and we'll see you here again next time. To hear more of the Student Lawyers Podcast, hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating and review.
If you would like to join The Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com.